taxes. One dollar per person. Well, to become knowledgeable about political issues, to find out about a, a tax proposal, to find out the reasonableness of whether it's good for 30 people to have this money redistributed to them for one reason or another or not, that involves cost on your part. You have to read the newspapers, you have to watch TV, you, you might be asked to sign a petition, an anti-special interest, anti-tax petition. You might be asked to go to a rally, an anti-tax anti rally, an anti-special interest rally, all of which involves time and money and your personal attention. And is it worth doing all of that to save one dollar? So the bias, the, the skewed prejudice, is towards the special interest group for whom the benefit is concentrated and less of an incentive or motive for those who will bear the burden, all the members of the society, because the burden is diffused among them. You know, in this article on um, why government grows, uh, I, on the second page, uh, I wrote this in 2008, so these are 2008 numbers uh, from the U.S. government, and you'll, you, I have a table here. And I list uh, selected U.S. government expenditures by federal departments or agencies. Agriculture, $94.7 billion. Commerce, $7.3 uh, Defense, $83 billion. Education, $68 billion. Health and Human Services, uh, $707 billion, and so on. And then I have two other columns. And why do I do this? I take that number and I divided it into the number of Americans estimated to exist in the country, approximately 300 million people. And then, however, taxpayers are different than people in the country. Not everybody who's in the country pays taxes, right? There are young, there are babies, babies don't pay taxes. There are elderly people, they don't pay taxes. And there are bums, they don't pay taxes. Okay, so let's just take taxpayers, right? The, the tax authorities know how many people pay taxes, the total number of taxpayers in the country. So I took that number and, and, and divided by the number of taxpayers, okay? So what do we find here? Well, the Department of Education spent $68 billion in the fiscal year 2008. That came out to, per person, in the U.S., $223. Per taxpayer, $582. Well, there's 12 months in the year, last time I looked. So divide 582, just taxpayers here, not it's even a smaller for per head, per capita. 582 by 12, that's less than $100 a month. Now divide that by four weeks in each month. Now divide that by in, into the number of days in a month. So what is the per day, per week, even per month cost of, of the Department of Education for the average taxpayer? Even if he even knows what it's costing him, which most taxpayers do not. On a daily basis, it's less than a pack of cigarettes. It's less than a meal at McDonald's. But what may seem like less than a meal at McDonald's or less than a pack of cigarettes on a, on a per day basis adds up to $68 billion. That's like the $30 billion. Now, how do you know that every dollar being spent by the U.S. Department of Education or your Ministry of Education is worth every dollar being spent? Why don't you know? It's your money. And the person next to you's money. But the problem is, is that you find and often think it's not worth the cost. To know enough, to know every dollar being spent by just the Ministry of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, on this program, on that program, because it's not just money, it's like different programs. different. Maybe you like some, but you think others would be superfluous or a waste of money or redundant or, 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 or not done effectively. So as a consequence, those who bear the burdens are, are skewed in a way to have little interest or motive or profit incentive in terms of saving tax dollars they have to pay, or are paying, to fight it, while the benefit is all concentrated. As I say in the article, this $68 billion goes to not just schools and teachers, but that money that, that, that the Department of Education spends on different school districts around the United States ends up being spent on what? Vendors who supply lunches at school, or the people who supply, who produce and sell the school desk furniture, or the publishers who print the books that the students use in school. Each of them become a special interest group dependent upon the continuation of this government money down to, that reaches them as, par, as, as, as segments of their revenue shares from doing whatever they do. And they have an incentive to keep that money flowing 
But what about us, the taxpayers? That's another thing that public choice theory emphasizes. And that's what's called rational ignorance. And this is an example of it, rational ignorance. Why do I say rational ignorance? It is sometimes reasonable and rational to not know things. How many of you ever had to do a class uh, research project or a term paper? Everybody, right? You went to the library, you went onto the internet, and you start reading articles, maybe some books, right? Did you read, in principle, everything that was hypothetically written on that subject? No. You stopped at some point, right? Because it wouldn't be worth your time. You have other classes or projects, as classes to study for other projects or term papers to write. There's just the fact that there's other per uses for your time other than school. So you have to ration your time so that you stop, learn, you stop learning at whatever it was you were studying to do the research project or the term paper before you, in principle, knew everything that there was to know on it in terms of written material. You chose to remain ignorant of some of the knowledge about that topic that you could have learned. Because in principle, there could have been a book or an article that you chose not to read. Ah, it's enough time. I don't have enough time to do more. Okay? There's some, there could have been something in that book or that article that would have been new and useful knowledge. But you chose to remain ignorant. Because it, it wasn't worth allocating more time to read one more book or one more article. So you, you remain rationally ignorant. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know how to fix my own car. I'm rationally ignorant of auto mechanics. I don't know how to make my own clothes. I don't know how to make my own glasses. I like to drink coffee every morning. I don't know how to make coffee. Well, I can use the machine, but you know what I mean, how to make coffee. Like the flavor in the little beans. I don't know how to do that. I'll a little syringe or something. Anyway. So we remain rationally ignorant about anything. Well, the same thing is rationally ignorant to remain ignorant as a voter citizen. Why? Well, in this context, let's suppose a society has 30 million people in it, okay? And now it's voting day. And all 30 million are eligible to vote. What is the probability that your vote is going to change the scale of the election? Well, probably not. Most elections aren't like these little you know, teeny weeny two votes made the difference. No, the winning candidate wins 52%, 55%, sometimes there's a landslide 60%, right? So your vote, in principle, has no weight. So whether you decide to go to the voting booth on election day or not, your decision is not going to, like, tip the scales. I mean, there have been close elections like that, like the, the presidential election uh, in, in 2000, and, and, the, and the vote in Florida, you know, went to the Supreme Court, and everything. the voting procedures, and everything. They're each little vote. But that's the rare exception to the rule. So why should you take an interest as a voter to, to give the time, effort, intellectual concentration, money to, to acquire knowledge or information or attend a lecture or, 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 or some special interest activity against these programs to be wise enough and intelligent enough to be an informed voter? There's no payoff for you. The cost is great. The, 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 the weight or value of your individual vote is small. So that's why most people don't know, I don't know what it like it is in the Bahamas. In the US, most people don't know who's on their local town council. People don't know who, who their, par, their, their congressional representative is, your parliamentary representative. Maybe your society is small enough, you know some of that. But in, in a lar in larger the society, the less you, you, you know about what's going on and who's doing it in the political process, because it's, the cost is too great. Because the benefit of trying to influence the election from one your little vote is too small. And that's another thing that works in the favor of the special interest, because they have an incentive to know who's running and where he stands on the issues and how, and how, how the election might come out if, if enough people vote that way to see that he gets elected so they get the, third, the 30 million, so each, uh, they get each a million from the 30 million in extra taxes. That's the gut bias and the skewedness of it. And this is the dilemma that every democratic country faces. You know, absolute monarchy was lousy because the king can be a rotten person. And even if he was a nice guy, he could have, like, the imbecile son, right? The imbecile king who takes over. The nut! Right? So a monarchy has a few shortcomings, right? And besides, he might be a cruel guy. He must, like, ride with his character.